Hi, everyone. It's Paul Ward here, and welcome to another 15 Minutes. I'm very excited today. We actually have three guests. It's the staff at Grenier Law, located in Ventura County, California. And we have Todd Manis, the owner of the company, along with Christine Grenier, the Director of Operations, and Waldo Ibarra. Welcome to 15 Minutes. Thank welcome. you. Thank you, Paul. Pleasure to be here. So I wanted to have you on today because I found out fairly recently, actually through Waldo, that it's a, a very small percentage of folks that have a family trust. And, you know, growing up, I really didn't know what a trust was, but I had certainly heard the term. And, uh, you know, my grandparents and my parents both had trusts and it was just kind of a, a fact of life that when you got older, you, that you would have a, a document that would protect your assets. And um, I realized that or found out recently that the vast majority of folks out there don't know what a trust is and certainly don't have one. Is that that's the case? Sure. That's, yes, it is. So so what percentage of folks out there have a trust? Probably 30 percent. We did a research one time and uh, of a neighborhood, neighborhoods, three, around 3,000 homes. And out of those 3,000 homes, only like 300. So it's maybe 10 percent. That's incredible. And for, folks, and for folks that don't know, what 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 is a trust? Just so folks know what we're talking about. The trust is a document in which you're going to list all the assets so that when you pass, uh, and it's going to list who those, uh, where those assets are going to be distributed when at the time that you pass. But in addition, it also will avoid probate. So in other words, a will, you would list all your assets and you'd say, here's who's going to get it and what have you. But a will would still have to go through the probate process. And the whole advantage of a trust is that it does not. It's quicker, private, less expensive, um, less stress on everyone involved. It's 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 a win 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 win. So if I have a house, a house and a bank account and a car, I can I can dictate or stipulate who it's gonna, which kid is gonna get what, or leads to less family squabbles. Exactly. Correct. And and why do folks not put a trust together? Do they just not know that it exists or do they not want to spend the money or is it kind of a combination of factors? Is it cultural? So the 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 main reason I feel that people do not have a trust is one, they're not educated. A lot of people have a will and think that that will cover their home. If they're a homeowner, a will will not cover their assets. It still would have to go to probate. The other thing is procrastination. So if they do understand that the living trust will protect their assets, it's not something that's urgent that they feel, um, especially for younger couples, they might, they think that, you know, they're not going to pass away in the near future and they'll um, put that off. Right. Somebody gets sick. Mm -hmm. That's a time that we seem to spike is if somebody uh, is hospitalized or has some health issues, then they start thinking about their trust. Sometimes it's not, in time though right so you, you did mention cultural and, and it is somewhat cultural as well it's a a topic that families also don't like talking about mm -hmm. it's a sore subject to bring up oh you're gonna pass away soon you're gonna pass away what are you gonna do let's not think about that right now let's not talk about that right there's been instances with our clients where it's been too late you know they again procrastinated on they, they came in, did a consult with us. They, they've gone to seminars. They know what it's about, but it's just actually doing it. And again, what Christine said, it's when somebody gets sick, now let's do it. And sometimes the price, the pricing, the, uh, oh, that's too expensive to do that. Why do we have to do this? Why don't we pay this? Can't we just do a will? The will is way cheaper. But again, as Christine said, the will, yes, the will can be contested and it's always best to do a living trust. You know, my father passed away in 99 and, you know, did not leave a trust. So we had to go through probate. And at that time, you know, I, I knew nothing because I was just a kid. Oh, well, not really, but, you know, 30. And, uh, you know, had an attorney or found an attorney through a friend. And uh, I think the cost of probate in 2000 was $15,000. 
um, which would probably be, you know, triple that today. Um, and then, of course, we had to wait for the courts to make make decisions and fighting with my siblings, which I had never done before. Right. So that's the only fight that I've ever had, actually, with my siblings was when my dad died over over money. Um, so yeah. if, he, if he had been organized, you know, we would have avoided that avoided that battle. Exactly. Claim the um, the cost of probate, how yeah, it works. If you go through the probate process, the, the, the costs, besides court costs and procedural stuff, you're going to have attorney's fees. And the attorney fee is set by statute. So it goes on a sliding scale. If the estate, uh, the first $100,000 of the estate, it's 4%. So if you had a $100,000 estate, it's $4,000. That's what the attorney's going to get. And then on the next 100, it's 3%. Uh, 3 okay. And then from 200 to 800,000, excuse me, 200 to a million, it's going to be 2%. Okay. And then above a million dollars, uh, it's going to be 1%, et cetera. And like I said, it's a sliding scale. But you can see that if you have a property that's worth, say, six, seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars $800,000, yeah, it's going to be up. You're going to say four plus three, there's the first 200, there's 7,000. Right. Plus, uh, yeah, exactly. So it's going to be ten, fifteen thousand $15,000. Right. Um, and then the court, the court need to, needs to determine who gets what, right? I mean, it might not be an even distribution, and maybe it won't even be what the what the parent wanted. It could, be, yeah, it could be. I mean, for instance, if there's a will, the will still gets probated, but at least with the will, the court will have some indication of what the uh, the decedent's intentions are. But if they died in testate, and it's going through uh, through probate, yeah, there's. It's going to be up. To, it's going to be up to the states and test state succession laws, and no one has any control of anything. So, what do you what do you recommend, or what what do you suggest to folks out there who you know obviously don't have a trust? That's our our topic. Um, they've kind of bantered it around, but they've they've put it off. What what do you say to them to really kind of bring home the message that this is you know this is important? The um, the the number one thing that our families say to us during the consultation is my kids won't fight. Well, when there's money involved, as you know, Paul, there is a fight and, and probate is very, very harmful to families. The, the um, trustee, the parents do, are not the ones who make the choice. It's the judge. So what I have to say is that this is one thing that is so crucial. If you do care about your family, you do care about where your assets go, you need to just stop procrastinating and get the trust done. Mm -hmm. It should be done at the time of purchase. And if it wasn't done at that time, it should be done now. And not 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 waiting until somebody gets hurt. You know, as you know, Paul, I lost my husband in a scuba diving accident. That's not something that we could foresee that could happen. Right. Things happen, life happens and gets in our way. So to be prepared, this is one of the most important things, and yet um, people don't treat it like that. Right. How long does the process take? It takes a, 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 usually an hour consultation. We go over all the, the um, named uh, beneficiaries and players in their trust, mm -hmm. and then within the week, we have it prepared for them and ready to go. So if you have three kids, you can leave your assets equally to them or or choose to even go to the grandkids or whoever you want. Exactly. The good thing about a trust is you are the one who's dictating where your assets go, where your hard work went into to, to build up your assets. Right. You can decide, but in probate, you do not. It doesn't have to be your kids. And to, to be honest with you, not a very good percentage of our clients do not give an equal shares to their children. For whatever reason, right. but yes, you name who your beneficiaries are going to be, and that's the benefit of having a trust. And and families are complicated. I mean, I have a blended family. I I have a a stepdaughter who I who I you know got when she was ten. And she's still you know involved you know part of her dad's life, but that made it a little bit complicated for my my wife and me because she's my stepdaughter, and I I do love her, but we also have a son, so we had to kind of figure out you know, that piece of it and what we purchased together and what we own separately when we got married. Um, so it's, it, it can be a little bit complicated. And that's the other good thing is in a living trust, the, 
married couple that has has a blended family do not have to do the same thing, you know, because you have your own will, she has her own will. You have your own power of attorneys. You own, you have your own HIPAA waivers, and it doesn't have to be the same players. So you're designing what you see your future to look like. Should you not be here, you're the one who who earned that money, the assets, and you're the one who can dictate where they go with a living trust. Without that, it goes to probate. They decide. And for the folks that don't know, what is what is HIPAA? You mentioned HIPAA. What is that? That is a waiver for the hospitals to be able to talk to your your loved ones because there's privacy policies. So if something were to happen to my parents and I were, were not on the HIPAA, I wouldn't be able to talk to the doctors once once they were in the hospital. And then the trust would also dictate if you want to prolong your life or you want the plug pulled. Is that correct? That is correct. So you're, you're pretty much designing your life after you're, you're not here. What happens to everything? So you, you're the one who, who can uh, state what you want. Right. What, what are the, um, the chapters in a living trust? So there's a bucket. So we have the, the living trust. We have the declaration of trust. We have the certificate of trust. Healthcare director. That's what you're talking about. Durable about. power of attorney. There's two power of attorneys. One's the durable, which is the financial. One is the health, the HIPAA waiver, and the personal property. So, 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 uh, so the client would come in, consult with you, provide you with a list of assets. If it's real estate, bank accounts, cars, maybe, you know, jewelry and art, if they have that. And then you would put this in a in a legal document and then they would sign that, right? And then certain folks would have uh, access to that document. I would assume that you would keep a copy and when that when that person passed away, then the, the, uh, the family would know how to distribute those assets. All your property is going into your trust. So you're going to want to go ahead and transfer the ownership to your house into the name of the trust which isn't to say that you don't own the house. It's just putting it in the name of the trust. Okay. You can put vehicles, you can put bank accounts. Um, yeah. You want to make sure you, you don't miss anything. Maybe later on you acquire right. a, another piece of property. Uh, you're going to want to go ahead and, uh, and put that in the trust, but you want to make sure that something doesn't get omitted. Doesn't right. Right. Who's, who's in charge once somebody passes, who, who makes, who kind of oversees the process when the when the trust is created uh the, the the trustor who is the person creating the trust he's going to name a, a <laughs> successor trustee who will administer the affairs after he's passed away and generally speaking they will also name an alternate successor trustee so for instance paul you might name you know you have your own trust you might name your son as the successor trustee but if uh, your son shall not be living or is unable to or unwilling to perform in those duties, then my daughter shall be the alternate successor trustee, et cetera. But it's, that's the person who's going to administer the trust and distribute the assets and take care of your affairs after you've passed away. And I would assume that the more detailed the trust is, that person being in charge, and obviously they're, they're going through their own grief process, I would think, in a lot of cases, the more detailed the trust is, the less animosity there is among the family members because the person who passed made the directive very clear. Right. The name of the game is intent. And as long as the, the testator's intent is clear, we've, we've done our job. Mm -hmm. And the success of trustee does have a time frame of when that has to be done by. Okay. Like you said they might have, take some a week, two weeks, three weeks to grieve, but... They do have a time frame. How often should somebody renew their trust? I mean, you, you know, people buy new cars and they move and, you know, open bank accounts and close bank accounts. How often should you update? I say every five to 10 years, sometimes sooner, depending on their situation. If any of the major players in their trust change, then they should, they should definitely um, amend their trust. But it sounds like the, the biggest challenge is still getting folks to take that leap and actually do what needs to be done and, and get a trust done. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was just going to say that uh, once once the, we call them the trustees, they're the owners of the trust. Once the trustees pass, then the revocable living trust becomes irrevocable. Mm -hmm. So the successor trustee that is in charge of administering the trust cannot make any changes. And I think that's where a lot of people get confused as well, is that 
they they don't have a successor trustee or they don't know who they could trust. Well, anybody could be the successor trustee because they cannot change anything that they put into their living trust. Interesting. So the so the person who who whose trust it is. Once they pass, no more changes. Correct. And you guys serve all of California? Correct. How, how, what's the, what's the best way? You have multiple offices, correct? In Ventura County? Correct. With Oxnard and Ventura. And both offices offer Spanish speaking services as well. Wonderful. Um, and we're also notaries in both offices. You're also so notary, the notaries? Yes. Okay. Um, what's the best way? And we'll certainly, we'll put it up on the, on the channel, but what's the best way for folks to folks to reach you? Do you have a general number that's the best for, for folks to reach out? Yes, it's 805-643-3900. They can also go on our website. GrenierLaw.com. Correct. Correct. So thank you guys for uh, joining us today. I hope I hope our watchers and listeners learned about an, about trusts and uh, you know, well, if they do not have one, they'll they'll reach out. Uh, because I think you've really stressed the importance of of uh, putting your affairs in order, and so there's not not chaos in the family after you go on to greener pastures. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.